Thank you all for, for coming along to the, for the talk tonight. It's, it's wonderful to see so many friends and, and colleagues. Um, so as Brian says, I'm going to be talking about the, the possible causes, or trying to explain the causes of the HIV decline in Zimbabwe. So in, the, in, in this talk, I'm hoping to tell you about two things. First of all, the contributions of the Manikalan study to improving understanding of HIV epidemics and HIV control in sub-Saharan Africa. And secondly, some of the work that we've been involved in, in describing and understanding the HIV decline in, Zimb in Zimbabwe. In the process, I hope to give you an idea of what we know currently about what works in HIV prevention in sub-Saharan Africa. First of all, I'd just like to explain this picture, or say something a little bit about this picture here, um, which is taken from a paper by Cathy Campbell and, and colleagues which shows one of the children's drawings that one of our Zimbabwean colleagues, Sivai Mupambarai, um, collected in a qualitative study of AIDS stigma amongst children in, as part of the Manikalan study. So there'll be one or two, two more pictures to, to liven up or to brighten up the, this presentation um, further down the line. Okay, so why did I drag you all here to hear about the HIV decline in Zimbabwe? Why do we think it, it's interesting? Um, well, hopefully, I'm sure you're all aware that HIV epidemics have taken enormous toll, in, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, over the last 20 to 30 years. The Population Council recently estimated that 24 million people had died from AIDS globally between, 1990, between 1980 and 2007, and projected that this total will reach 75 million by the year 2030. Secondly, as you would hope, very substantial investments have been made over the years in HIV control programs. UNAIDS estimated in their report this year that as much as $15.9 billion have been made available for the AIDS response by international donors and governments in 2009 alone. However, despite this, these very substantial investments, there are sadly only a very small number of success stories to learn from in sub-Saharan Africa. If we count a success story as being a country where HIV rates <laughs> have been shown to have been reduced by successful HIV control programs. Before I try and explain this, this graph, I ought to um, try to explain to you the difference between HIV prevalence and HIV incidence. This was something that Brian insisted I should do um, very wisely. Um, so HIV prevalence is defined as being the fraction of the population that is currently infected, which includes individuals who are infected in the past and who are still alive at the time of the, of the estimate. In contrast, HIV instance, which is the rate at which previously uninfected individuals are becoming newly infected. So what this particular graph here is showing is the trends in HIV prevalence, not the trends in HIV instance. Okay, so looking at it this way, um, you can see that Zimbabwe stands out uh, as being one of the countries that's had the, the very largest e epidemics um, in sub-Saharan Africa but also as one of the countries that's seen one of the steepest and most sustained declines in prevalence over time since the epidemic peaked, in the case of Zimbabwe, around about 1997. It is also one of the few countries which I hope to show you that there is evidence that the decline was driven largely by behavior change and successful prevention programs. Okay, so, why, so one of the reasons, one of the main reasons for the lack of success stories is the difficulty in establishing program impact. This arises from the complexities in measurement and attribution, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a few minutes, and also the natural dynamics of HIV epidemics. HIV prevalence declines are obviously a good thing in the sense that they reflect a reduction in the burden of infection within the population. However, a decline in prevalence, in its simplest sense, really only means that previously infected people are dying at a faster rate than new people are becoming infected. Also, it is possible for HIV prevalence to fall even when there's been no reduction in risky behaviors due to what is known as the natural dynamics of HIV epidemics. Don't worry, there's not going to be too many slides like this. <laughs> um, 
Th this is because there's usually variation in the extent to which individuals are exposed to infection when an HIV epidemic um, is introduced within a population. But once an epidemic starts, those with the most risky behaviours become infected at a relatively rapid rate. Then once most of those, these individuals have become infected, the overall rate of new infections, which is the HIV incidence rate, becomes closer to the rate amongst individuals with safer behaviours and therefore reduces over time. Eventually, as the death rate from AIDS rises, this can translate into a fall in HIV prevalence. Another complication that arises from the natural dynamics of HIV epidemics is that the effects of reductions in risk behaviours can often be non-linear. Mathematical modelling studies have found that initial reductions in risk behaviour can have only a small impact on infection rates. However, once the level of risk falls to a critical point, further reductions can have a much larger impact. This means that it's difficult to detect effects of programs simply from looking at HIV trends on their own because both HIV incidence and prevalence can continue to rise after risk behaviour has begun to reduce and also HIV incidence and prevalence can fall even when there's been no reduction in risk behaviour. Further complications are that behaviour change could arise largely spontaneously from within the population rather than in response to HIV prevention programmes. Also, as Cathy Campbell likes to remind me, um, good knowledge is a necessary but is rarely a sufficient requirement for adoption of protective behaviours because of the many contextual and psychosocial obstacles to behaviour change. Oops. Good. Still working. Um, one way we might be able to overcome some of these problems is by comparing trends in different countries that have implemented different programmes. However, unfortunately, at least for this, for this purpose, similar programmes have been implemented in many different countries under the guidance of UNAIDS and the, and the World Health Organization. Therefore, often we've had to resort to the use of mathematical model simulations to provide us with counterfactuals, which kind of illustrate what might have happened in the absence of any behaviour change or any program, program, programmatic impact. Community randomised controlled trials in which communities are randomly assigned to receive interventions or to act as controls for the period of the trial can provide evidence of in intervention impact at the population level and are regarded as a gold standard for impact evaluation. However, there are a number of limitations of, of such trials. They can tend to be complex, expensive and difficult to implement. Results may not be relevant at, in, in other places or at other points in time and interventions that have been evaluated and shown to, where they've shown to work may have smaller effect sizes when put to scale under real world con conditions. As a consequence, not very many of these trials have actually been conducted and only a few of those that have been conducted have been successful in identifying effective programmatic strategies or prevention strategies. More generally, to be convincing, we need evidence that an intervention is effective in reducing HIV incidence and associated risk behaviours. However, there are problems in generating estimates of HIV incidence and unbiased estimates of behaviour change, problems that we, amongst others, have sought to address in our research. OK, so what is the Minikaland HIV STD prevention study? The study was originally inspired by the early Masaka and Rakai studies in Uganda and the Mwanza trial in, in Tanzania. These early studies had yielded many important insights and still do um, into the spread and impact of HIV infection. However, there's still only a small handful of such longitudinal prospective population-based HIV surveys in sub-Saharan African populations. We were also interested in collecting data to validate early mathematical model projections of the scale and impact of HIV epidemics in Africa, many of which were done um, by, by Roy Anderson and his colleagues from the, from the mid-1980s, mid I think. <laughs> um, so I approached the Population Investigation Committee at, at LSE, where I'd just been doing my, my master's, and they kindly gave me a small travel grant to, to visit a few countries in eastern and southern, southern Africa to look for possible collaborators. 
And Roy suggested that I, I go to meet Dr. Stephen Chandiwana, who at the time was the director of the Blair Research Institute in Zimbabwe, because he thought he might be somebody who'd be interested in this kind of, this kind of work. So I went down to Zimbabwe and I visited the Blair Research Institute. You might not be surprised to know it's no longer na known as the Blair Research Institute. The, <laughs> the word Blair isn't um, <laughs> politically, politically correct in, in the Zimbabwe context anymore. Um, but Steve, as I say, was, was very interested. This is a picture down at the bottom there of, of Steve Chandiwana. Sadly, he died a couple of years ago. Um, but standing outside one of the famous Blair, Blair toilets uh, with <laughs> a colleague of mine at the time, Anne, Anne Berrington from the, from the LSE, well, she was at the LSE, just looking a little bit anxious <laughs> not to be shown around the Blair toilet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so these, are the, the main, these have been the main scientific aims of the Miniculan study over the years. First of all, to describe trends in the spread of HIV infection in a general population sample. This is more important than it might seem because most of the data that are used in national HIV surveillance systems are collected from pregnant women attending for routine antenatal checkups, which can give a distorted picture of patterns and trends in infection rates. Secondly, to provide data on the demographic impact of HIV and AIDS in a sub-Saharan African population. And third, to provide data on the impact of HIV control programs at the individual, at local population, and the, the national, ultimately the national, national level. And in the process, we hope to contribute to the development of methods for tracking trends in HIV and associated risk behaviors and for evaluating HIV control programs. Some of the wider objectives of the Minicaland project have been to support efforts in evidence-based HIV AIDS control within the study districts where, we, where we're working and to contribute to the development of research and program capacity within Zimbabwe. Okay, so a few de details of the design of the, of the, kind of the core um, component of the Minikalan study. So since 1998, we've been working in 12, 12 different study sites spread around three districts in Minikalan province, which is the eastern province of Zimbabwe, bordering on, on Mozambique. Um, the, the 12 sites were selected to include two small towns, um, two tea coffee estates, um, two forestry plantations, two roadside trading set settlements, and four subsistence farming, farming areas. At the beginning of the, at the, beginning of the, uh, the study, and we undertook a household census in each of these 12, 12 sites, and this census has been updated at each following round. In each round, we recruit individual household members for, for, interview, for kind of more detailed interviews and HIV testing. Um, up until the, the fourth round, we were looking at ages 15 to 54. In the fifth round, which is just about to finish, the end of July, uh, we've extended that to include children in the age range 2 to 14. In each round, we interview around about 10,000 individuals. Follow-up surveys are conducted after every two or three, three years, and the participation rates have generally been of the order of 80%, with follow-up rates within the kind of core co cohort um, fluctuating between around about 50% and 60% if you exclude people who've died. The actual refusal rate is only, has been less than 2% in each, in each round. Most of the loss to follow up has been caused by migration out of the, out of the study areas. Obviously in, in Zimbabwe, as you might expect, there's, there's quite a lot of population movement over the, last, over the period of this, this study. Um, for the people who died, we conduct what's called verbal autopsy interviews. Um, a nurse from the study team goes to visit the person who is the primary caregiver for the deceased person to find out more about the symptoms um, that the person had before they died and more about the circumstances surrounding the, the death. And then we conduct what's called parallel HIV surveillance among pregnant women attending local antenatal clinics so that we can compare trends <coughs> that you would get using standard HIV surveillance methods used by most countries within the region um, with what we're seeing in our general population sample. <coughs> 
sure how clear this, this figure is, but I just wanted to say a little bit about the, the survey timelines, and in particular to, 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 uh, to mention that in each round, each round of the survey actually takes about two years to conduct because we don't do the survey in the 12 areas all at once. Um, we start with the first site each time and then move to the second one and the third one and so on. So it's a bit of a painting of the fourth road bridge type of, type of process. We get to the end of one survey and then it's almost time to start the next, the next round. So following this procedure, as I say, we've almost finished five rounds of, uh, of this kind of core survey up to now. Um, in, in conjunction with, with all this kind of quantitative work, increasingly over the last few years, we've also been collecting a lot of qualitative data in collaboration with Cathy Campbell and her colleagues from the London School of Economics. Okay, so what have been the contributions to understanding HIV trends of this, of this project? So these are some of the key questions that we've been trying to investigate using the data from the, from the surveys, as I've just mentioned. And all of these relate in some way to understanding trends in the HIV epidemic in Zimbabwe. I'm going to, in the next few slides, I'm going to run through these different questions rather quickly, just to try and give you an idea of the scope of the study. And in, in the process, I'll, I'll highlight one or two specific examples. Okay, so the, question, the first question is, how can we get more accurate HIV estimates? Um, so we've done a lot of work, particularly in collaboration with Basha Jabba from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and other colleagues from the UNAIDS reference group um, on HIV estimates, which is housed within the Department of Infectious Disease Epidemiology at Imperial. Um, this has been necessary because, as I say, the, the data from collected from antenatal clinics um, can be subject to biases due to selective inclusion of the most sexually active women, particularly at younger ages, and subfertility in HIV-positive women at older ages. And obviously, um, the data from pregnant women attending antenatal clinics doesn't tell us anything directly about what's happening in men. So, um, and there are various other, other biases that I won't go into. Um, the second area that we've, we've focused on here has been in developing methods to reduce bias in self-reported data on sexual behavior. Um, some researchers, Paul Hewitt, Barbara Mench, and, and colleagues at the Population Council um, have developed a method called ACASI, Audio Computer Assisted Interviews. Um, but what we've tried to do in, in Manicaland is develop a, a, what we call a secret voting method as a cheap alternative, which is practical to use in more remote rural areas. The, the general aim being to try trying to reduce reporting biases in the data on sexual behavior, because obviously people might be a bit embarrassed or reluctant to admit um, some of the risky activities that they've been, been involved in. So the idea is to try and make the, the data collection methods more confidential so that people feel more at ease um, telling, giving us truthful information. Oops. Okay, and the, the third point I wanted to mention here um, is the development of indirect estimates for HIV incidents. I mean, this has been work that we've done, well, I did initially with a colleague called um, Crystal Donnelly in our department, and more recently it's been, the, the work has been moved forward a lot by, by Tim Hallett um, in collaboration with Basha Jabba and mem other members of something called the Alpha Network, which is a network of, of similar kind of um, long-term population-based surveys of HIV in sub-Saharan African populations. And essentially what we've been able to do is develop methods for estimating, producing estimates of HIV incidence from two rounds of age-specific HIV prevalence data. Um, this addresses the need for estimates of HIV incidence without the complexities and expense involved in conducting large-scale cohort studies such as the one that we're doing in, in Manicaland. So these methods can be applied in lots of other countries and other populations where you don't have such cohort studies. Um, and it's turned out that these methods are proving to be very useful, at least in the interim, whilst work continues to develop more reliable biomedical assays, for instance. Okay, the next question is, who are the most vulnerable people to HIV infection, or who are the least vulnerable people to HIV infection within African, African populations? So here we've, 
done quite a lot of work um, looking at behavioral and other risk factors, what I call other risk factors for HIV transmission and conducting more detailed studies, for example, on the influence of education and religion to, to see which, for example, we found that people who are more educated, who have secondary school education or above, as you might hope, tend to be um, less vulnerable or more, more able to avoid, successfully avoid um, becoming infected with, with HIV. Um, perhaps the most interesting thing I think within this work has been what we've been doing with Cathy and her colleagues on community responses to the spread of HIV infection, which is currently being supported by the World Bank. Um, I think this uh, has represented a very nice and productive example of collaboration between qualitative and quantitative researchers. So what we've found so far in a nutshell, um, is that sexual risk behaviour and HIV incidence tend to be reduced in women who participate in functional community, community groups, such as savings clubs, burial societies, women's groups, and even sports clubs, um, which is particularly gratifying. So, so in, in, in the context of this, it's particularly grat gratifying that our own um, fieldwork team formed themselves into a, football, into a football team. So I'm hoping that this is helping them to avoid becoming infected themselves. Um, our colleague, our, our research associate, what do we call you? Research fellow, um, Mercy Namo, <laughs> within our project, um, has also been doing some work looking at, in which she's established that women, actually women and men, who participate in these groups tend to have less stigmatizing attitudes towards people living with AIDS, which is another kind of benefit of participation in these groups. Okay, so the next question is, is the HIV epidemic getting better or worse? Um, so what we've found is that HIV prevalence has been steadily declining in our, in our study areas for both males and females since the late 1990s. And this has been due to a combination of falling HIV incidence rates, at least initially, and very high AIDS mortality rates. The little, if you can see them, the little yellow dots over here represent the, the death rates amongst HIV positive individuals uh, within, our, within our study, in comparison with the little green dots at the, moment, uh, at the bottom that represent a, um, death rates amongst un uninfected individuals of the, same, of the same age. And you can see the, the scale of the difference. The small black squares there show the trend in HIV incidence, which, as I say, has been falling, it was falling quite, quite rapidly initially, but in the most recent intersurvey period, there's a suggestion of a leveling off and a possible slight increase in the HIV incidence rate, which is obviously a big concern now. We also have a lot of data on various different indicators of sexual behavior and sexual behavior um, change. For both males at the top and for females at the bottom, these are a range of different indicators. Sorry if you can't quite read it, but, but in short, what it's, what it's showing is that for multiple sexual partners, casual partners in the last two or three years, um, concurrent partners, having a new partner in the last 12 months, all of these different indicators, there are evi there's evidence for reductions in, in risky behaviours um, occurring over time for both men and for women, and also evidence of an increase in consistent condom use amongst those that continue to have casual, to form casual sexual partnerships. The exception to this is, is for women, again, for the most recent inter-survey period, where there's, a, a, again, a worrying um, picture of an increase in the proportion of women who are reporting multiple sexual partners or casual partners in the last two to three years and, and so on, which kind of fits with, with what I showed you just now. This indication that the, the rate of new infections might have started to increase around about this time. This is around about 2007, 2008, which is the time when the economy really did go into nosedive and that, that's when we experienced the, the real hyperinflation and the uh, collapse of the Zimbabwe dollar. More about that in a minute. Um, so the next area, next question was how bad are the effects of HIV? And here we're looking at the demographic impacts of the HIV epidemic. So some of the key findings here have been that around about three quarters of the adult deaths occurring in our Manicoland study areas have been related to HIV infection. On fertility, we found that the HIV virus reduces infected women's biological ability to bear children in our Manicoland study areas, uh, as well as uh, as has also been found in other, other populations in Africa. In some work led by Basha Zaba, um, 
we estimated that at the population level, birth rates are reduced by 4% for every 10% of HIV prevalence. A particular interest of the study, which goes back to Roy and Jeff Garnett's early mathematical modeling work within the research group, has been on the impact of HIV epidemics on population growth rates. As it's turned out, the size of the, of the epidemic in eastern Zimbabwe has reached similar levels to those predicted in, in these early modeling studies, which were done in the early 1990s, although no behavior change was included in the model, so the large subsequent decline in prevalence was not, was not captured. Our projections of further fertility decline turned out to be reasonably accurate. However, in reality, when we actually measured, took, took measurements of the change in population growth, we found that the combined impact of, of the HIV epidemic and fertility decline, although substantial, were rather less than had been predicted. This seems to have been due to a combination of factors, including concentrations of women in the childbearing age groups, um, in, in, in the worst affected areas, and somewhat lower than expected mother-to-child transmission of HIV and longer than expected survival periods after infection. Following on from some of the work on the demographic impact, um, researchers within our team have done a lot of work um, to, to investigate the effects of orphanhood on children's, children's lives, looking at the effects, you know, describing associations between orphanhood and, and poorer nutrition status, health status, different types, um, well, a greater likelihood of dropping out of school, as well as psychological well-being. The figures shown here are, are work taken from Constance Nyamakapa's PhD thesis, in which she found evidence for greater psychological distress in orphaned children, and she also developed and tested a theoretical framework for understanding the intermediate causes of heightened distress. Um, differences in place of residence, exposure to severe poverty, relationship to household head, school enrollment, and support from the closest adult all contributed to, to the disadvantage experienced by, by orphaned children. She also found evidence for greater psychosocial distress um, being associated with, with earlier onset of sexual intercourse, which part, partly may explain the, the next findings. Um, we found evidence in Naomi um study population for increased risk of adolescent HIV infection amongst, amongst girls living within the study, the study areas, um, and in particular amongst girls whose mothers, mothers had died or whose mothers or parents were still alive, but for whom one or both of the parents was HIV, HIV positive. Isolde Berthissel and Judith Glynn um, also found a similar association for HIV and herpes simplex virus 2 amongst adolescent girls in a high density suburb in Harare. So it kind of seems to, seems to be, this finding was replicated in urban areas as well as the rural areas that we, we mainly work in. And it's also been replicated subsequently in a number of studies um, in other countries. Okay, so the last, I think this is the last <laughs> um, area before we really focus on the HIV decline, um, is the question of whether HIV control programs are, are working. Currently, we're just, a, just in, the, in the process of finalizing a community randomized control trials, a tr trial of, of cash transfers with and without conditions to improve the well-being of orphaned and vulnerable children. This is um, a study that was designed by Laura Robertson as part of her PhD within our, within our department. Uh, some of the preliminary um, results from an m and &E, from m and &E surveys, that's monitoring and evaluation survey, um, suggest that young children living in households that receive cash transfers were more likely to have birth certificates which are needed for access to basic, basic services. However, this positive development tended to disappear for children in households where no conditions were attached, perhaps because caregivers in these households realized that they did not to need to obtain birth certificates to continue to receive cash transfers. There's a big debate amongst donors as to whether you should attach conditions when you're providing um, cash transfers to households to, for the benefit of, of children. Um, so part of the aim of our study here is to inform that, that debate. Um, we've also the project's also provided support um, to Boshi Malala, um, who 
conducted a, a PhD again in our, within our department for a randomized controlled trial in which she demonstrated the feasibility of male involvement in prevention of mother-to-child transmission of HIV in Cape Town in, in South Africa, a study that was, was also um, involved Marie-Claude Wally. Um, and finally, the, perhaps the main intervention study that we've been involved in is, is another community randomized control trial of a peer education and strengthened treatment of sexually transmitted infections intervention amongst um, women involved in sex work and their, and their male partners. And the results from this, from this trial showed that, that men who had participated in project activities had a more or less a 50% lower risk of, of becoming newly infected with HIV compared to similar men who, who, didn't, um, who weren't exposed to the program activities. However, similar findings were not found amongst women who participated in the, in the program. And uh, unfortunately, in terms of the main, the main objective of the study, um, we, didn't, we didn't see any kind of improvement, any reduction in HIV incidence at the community level. Possible reasons for the failure of the intervention included that the peer educators uh, who were involved in the program provided rather poor role models for behavior change. In particular, quite a few of them became pregnant, so it became fairly obvious that they weren't kind of practicing what they were preaching. Um, they extended their activities beyond the bars and the beer halls into the wider community, which could have had some adverse effects, particularly in kind of, in a sense, advertising the whole idea of sex work amongst a new generation of younger younger girls. Uh, another problem was that there was what we call contamination of the intervention uh, in the sense that a similar program to what we were trying to evaluate was implemented by one of the partners in one of the study areas which was supposed to be a control, <coughs> control area for the study in Nyanga. M more work using qualitative data is being done on this at the moment by Cathy and uh, her team at the LSE. Okay, so why did HIV decline in, in Zimbabwe? Well, at the simple, simplest level, it's, it's largely because adult death rates reached extremely high levels in the late 1990s, uh, as you can see from this, this figure here. However, it's also because HIV incidence rates continued to fall after the period when the effects of the natural dynamics of the epidemic would have been expected to have worn off. This figure here um, is generated by a mathematical model developed and fitted by by our colleague Tim Hallett within our department to the national HIV surveillance data. And it suggests that HIV incidence rose rapidly in the, in the 1980s um, to a peak in the early, early 1990s, if you follow this green line, green line here. After that, it, HIV incidence fell and stabilized and, and then stabilized in the mid 1990s, which is kind of what you would expect from the natural dynamics of, of the HIV epidemic with the infection levels saturating within the highest, highest risk groups. However, following this, um, Tim's model fit, fits suggested that there had been an accelerated decline in the HIV incidence rates between the period around about 1998 and 2004, which led to the, to the subsequent decline in HIV prevalence, shown in the red dashes, dashes here, and, and later on to a drop in, in AIDS death rates. So this is what we think was happening epidemiologically. At the same time, we looked at um, data from a number of different um, behavior surveys, both from our own data within the mini study, but also data from um, national surveys, such as demographic and health surveys in Zimbabwe, and found that during the same period, between the late 1990s and the early, early 2000s, there was evidence for, for substantial reductions um, in a number of different indicators of risky behavior, particularly relating to multiple sexual partnerships. Um, the evidence for any delays in age at first sex or increases in consistent condom use was rather more mixed, with some surveys suggesting that had been changes, other surveys suggesting not. So, so the timing of these changes in behavior uh, sh shown in the survey, in, in these surveys, is consistent with Tim's modeling, model fits. Okay, so following this earlier epidemiological review, a multidisciplinary team was assembled 
made up of researchers from Imperial College, Harvard, University of Zimbabwe, and the local office of UNFPA to investigate a number of possible explanations for the HIV decline, which are, are listed here. Um, the team used a combination of sec secondary analysis of survey data, mathematical modeling, historical mapping of the national response, and collection and analysis of new qualitative data to, to explore these different possible explanations. In assessing the different explanations, um, we applied a number of different tests um, to establish whether each particular explanation was a, a credible, um, could have made a credible combination to the HIV contribution to the HIV decline. First of all, there had to be evidence for a plausible causal pathway via what we call the proximate determinants, which are the factors directly affecting transmission of the virus, such as multiple sexual partnerships, consistent condom use, and factors affecting the transmission probability of infection between an infected person and previously uninfected person per sexual contact, such as, for example, the presence of other sexually transmitted infections. Secondly, there needed to be evidence for population effectiveness of the intervention or other, other factor, either from community randomized control trials or from a combination of individual level evidence and mathematical modeling studies. Third, there needed to be evidence that there was substantial coverage or exposure to, uh, amongst the key target groups to the, to the intervention or to the, to, to the factor. And finally, there had to be consistency in the timing of the change in the factor with the period of rapid reduction in HIV risk, which as I say, we've, we'd identified as being between 1998 and 2004. Okay, so the first of these possible explanations we've touched on a little bit already, this is the natural course of the HIV epidemic. Tim, fitted, Tim used Bayesian methods to fit a mathematical model to the national HIV surveillance data for urban and rural areas and found that good statistical fits could only be obtained if it was assumed in the model that reductions in risk behavior had occurred between 1998 and 2004, as I mentioned. So what we call counterfactual models suggested that the natural dynamics on their own would have been insufficient to account for the size, and in particular the timing of the HIV decline in Zimbabwe. Second, as we've seen, that there's quite a lot of empirical evidence for HIV instance having continued to decline after the time that you would have expected it to have stabilized if it was just coming down because of the natural dynamics of the epidemic. And thirdly, again, as we've seen, there's empirical evidence for substantial behavior change during the period, exactly the period when the model fits are indicating an acceleration in risk reduction. The second possible explanation is what we call the funeral effect, which is kind of an indirect effect of a very high AIDS mortality. Um, I don't know if you can see this very well, but in the, in the children's drawing here, um, the child has, uh, has, um, has shown a picture of a bed with an AIDS patient sleeping in it right next to the family graveyard. So, so, so the idea here is that um, the epidemic had reached the stage where so many people had died that almost everyone in the population either knew a close friend or relative who had been sick or died, died from AIDS. So the whole thing came much closer to home. Everyone realized that I could also be affected by this. It's not just other people out there who have very risky lifestyles. This is something that's happening to almost everyone. So the timing for this is certainly consistent. As we've seen, um, death rates reached extremely high levels by the late 1990s. Also in focus group discussions and other qualitative investigations conducted as part of this exercise, um, participants consistently identified the high death rate as having been a very important motivating factor for their adopting safer, safer behaviors. However, whilst it's clearly very important uh, on its own, probably wouldn't have been sufficient uh, unless people had correct information about what kind of, kinds of changes in behavior they needed to adopt to protect themselves from becoming infected and had access to the means for avoiding HIV infection, such as the availability of condoms and effective treatment services for other sexually transmitted infections. Third possibility is international migration. So the idea here is that basically all the HIV positive people in Zimbabwe left the country, um, so that that's kind of led to the decline in HIV, HIV prevalence. Um, again, we had to resort here to mathematical modeling studies, uh, which conducted with, with help from Tim Hallett. 
um, and his model scenarios indicated that migration would clearly have needed to be very highly selective as well as extremely substantial to have, to have brought about sort of brought about the kind of HIV decline that we've seen in, seen in Zimbabwe. And the rather limited evidence that we were able to piece together as part of this review um, actually suggests the opposite. We actually find that HIV prevalence is lower, for example, in pregnant women attending antenatal clinics in, in the UK, who had formerly come from, from Zimbabwe, compared to their counterparts who've remained in Zimbabwe. The next possibility is the economic collapse more generally, and, and in particular, the possibility that by substantially increasing poverty within the country, this, this might have led to the kind of changes in behavior that we've observed um, in the review. The argument here is that the effect of fewer women, being, sorry, fewer men being able to afford to pay for transactional sex must have outweighed the effect of any possible increase in the numbers of women who were driven into offering transactional sex as a result of increases in poverty levels. The evidence from the Meekland study and also from demographic and health surveys certainly supports this to the extent that um, we've seen declines in reports of transactional sex over time, both from, as reported by men and by women in the, in the surveys. However, um, close examination of, of trends in various different economic indicators suggests that, that the real collapse in the economy only took place from towards the end of this key period, 1998-2004. Um, also kind of referring back to, the, to one of the earlier slides that I, I showed you, um, we saw there that the proportion of women reporting multiple sexual partnerships and HIV incidents increased subsequently when the economy really did collapse around about 1997 and no, two, 2007 and 2008. Okay, the next possible explanation that I'm going to consider is biomedical interventions. But before I go into, into that, for the specific case of Zimbabwe, we thought you might be quite interested just to have a very quick snapshot of, of what we think we know at the moment about what works in terms of biomedical interventions. There are people out there amongst you in the audience who are much more knowledgeable about these kind of things than I am, so please forgive me if I make any mistakes or any major omissions in this slide. But we thought we'd try and give you something on this. Um, the, the, the main kind of biomedical intervention that's been um, examined over a, a long period of time is the possibility that controlling better control of other sexually transmitted infections might help to, to slow the spread of HIV infection. And certainly there's a lot of evidence from a number of, um, number of, kind of individu individual level surveys that, that shows strong associations but, you know, or correlations between infection with HIV and infection with um, other sexually, sexually transmitted infections such as syphilis and gonorrhea um, at the individual level, even after you control for common risk behaviors. However, the evidence from trials now is, is rather mixed. The, the first trial, which is a kind of landmark trial in the early 1990s in, in southwest Uganda, um, no, in northwest Tanzania, um, <laughs> showed a 42% showed a reduction in HIV incidence rate. But subsequent trials, including our, our study in, in Manicaland, have failed to find any, any such effect. Um, a second approach kind of fits in, broadly speaking, within under the sexually transmitted infections heading, as the idea that is the, has been the idea that providing suppressive therapy using the drug isoclavir for a particular STD called herpes simplex virus 2 um, might help to slow the spread of HIV infection. But the one trial that I'm aware of there has failed to find an effect. The third possibility is male circumcision. This is something else that's been debated a lot almost since the beginning of the, beginning of the epidemic. But in the, in the mid-2000s, um, three trials were, were conducted, three individual level con trials were conducted, which all showed very substantial reductions in the risk of HIV incidence amongst me men who were circumcised within the program. So the reduction is in transmission from, from women to men. Okay. And as a result, as a consequence of these, these results, um, quite a few countries now are, are trying to scale up programs in which male circumcision services are made available within the general population. And further studies are being conducted to see if they can identify a, a population level impact. This is important because 
There's concern about there's concern that the effect sizes that are seen in individual level trials might not translate into similar effects at the population level. For example, due to what we call behavioral disinhibition, the, the idea that once people have been circumcised, they might think that, that they're now safe, even though you know, the risk is reduced, but it's not eliminated. So if they resort to or revert to, to having multiple partners and not using condoms, then that could um, counteract any beneficial effect of the, of the male circumcision, any increases in male circumcision, at, certainly at the population level. Um, other approaches that have been, been tried um, again, over quite, quite a few years, um, various different microbicides, which are a, a female-controlled, um, potentially a female-controlled potential HIV prevention um, measure. Um, quite a few studies have been done to try and evaluate different microbicides without any success until last year. Um, something called the CAPRISA trial um, reported its results and found a, reported a 54% um, reduction in the risk of HIV. Um, transmission amongst those who adhered most closely to the intervention. Um, Pre-exposure prophylaxis is the idea that you give people antiretroviral treatment um, for a period shortly before they engage in risky, risky behavior. Again, there's mixed results from the two or three studies that have been done on this so far, um, but there's was, was one study here amongst men who have sex with men that found a 44% reduction in the HIV incidence rate. Then. Um, an idea that's, that's, that's received a lot of attention in the last few years is the idea that providing people, uh, pu putting people who are HIV positive onto antiretroviral treatment much, much earlier, um, or less as soon as they're identified as being HIV positive, could, could dramatically reduce um, HIV transmission. And there's a couple of studies here that you, you can see they're having dramatic, huge, um, huge effects in reducing HIV transmission. Have there are a lot of kind of cost and um, logistical complications in uh, and other complications in implementing such a strategy, which are being worked on further at the moment. And then down the bottom of he bottom here, uh, in terms of the risk to children through mother-to-child transmission, um, a lot of work's been done over the years to evaluate different combinations of antiretroviral treatment, uh, uh, antiretroviral, antiretroviral drugs given to mothers and infants at different stages during and after pregnancy. Um, and a number of these different approaches have been shown to have large effects in reducing transmission from mother to child. In, in Zimbabwe now, we're currently in the process of trying to adopt a more, what they're calling a more efficacious regimen, which is, which is also rather more complicated. So we'll see how we, how we get on. Okay, so returning to Zimbabwe via medical interventions. So um, Zimbabwe, was quite quick off the mark in the 1980s in introducing blood and injection safety precautions within the country, and also in developing and implementing what they call the syndromic management of sexually transmitted infection program. However, it was considered by the team in this exercise that these programs were introduced too early to have contributed to the HIV decline within Zimbabwe that, as you've seen, took hold from the late 1990s. Nonetheless, these programs may have contributed to some extent indirectly by making transmission more fragile within the population, as I suggested um, at the beginning of this talk. Other interventions like prevention of mother-to-child transmission, voluntary counseling and testing, and antiretroviral treatment were all introduced too late to have contributed to the HIV decline, at least in, in its early stages. And the male circumcision program is just being introduced this year um, within Zimbabwe with previous levels of, of male circumcision within Zimbabwe having been around about 8%, so quite low, and possibly having been one of the factors that have contributed to our having a very large epidemic in the country in the first place. Okay, so now we come to behavior change interventions. So as part, part of this um, exercise, a very detailed program mapping um, oops, I'm wrong. Uh, a very detailed program ma mapping exercise was, was undertaken. Um, this figure here shows um, developments in policy and leadership over, over time. And in particular, I wanted to highlight, you can see the red box down there, the establishment of the National AIDS Council with its decentralized structures down to district and, and village level from the late 1990s, which was followed a year later um, 
by the introduction of something called the AIDS levy, which is essentially a tax on the working population, which raised money to support the programs that were being implemented by the National AIDS Council. Um, partly as a consequence of the establishment of the National AIDS Council and the, um, the funding that it received, um, there was a big scale up, a big increase in the numbers of AIDS service organizations um, that were founded from the late 1990s through to the early, early 2000s. And this slide here describes some of, the, some of the main different activities that were being implemented um, at different times during the response. In the review, we looked at uh, trends in a, in a range of different outputs and, and the coverage of, of program activities. Um, this figure over here shows the trends in numbers of condoms distributed from the early 1990s through to the late, late 2000s. So you can see there was a steady increase. And interestingly, from the late 1990s again, um, there was an interesting change in the mix in terms of the sources of where, from which um, people were obtaining their condoms towards increasing numbers, um, getting their condoms from social marketing um, outlets, particularly from Population Services International, using something called the Protector Plus condom. Um, even though people, even though the amount that people were having to pay was quite small and became rather tiny with the um, with the hyperinflation, um, the fact that people are actually paying to buy these condoms makes it a little bit more plausible, more credible that, that, that they might actually have been using them. The figure on the right here shows, c compares data from 1994 with data from 2001, 2002 in reports on where people are getting the information about HIV and AIDS. This is for men, but the picture for women is rather similar. And you can see big increases in proportions of men reporting having obtained information about HIV and AIDS from schools, from friends, relatives, from churches and, and workplaces. Okay, whilst it was kind of discovered um, in the review that there was relatively little emphasis on faithfulness or, or no more emphasis on faithfulness as compared to abstinence or condom use or other approaches to, to HIV prevention within the Zimbabwe response. However, participants in the focus group discussions acknowledged that programs had, had played a part in, in their adoption of safer, safer behaviours, but were unable to identify specific interventions that they, they felt had make a dif made a difference to themselves. And then in a national level stakeholders meeting that was conducted towards the end of this exercise, um, participants in the meeting um, were of the view that these programs probably had, had made a contribution. Okay, as with um, the biomedical interventions, there have been a number of trials that have tried to evaluate the impact of behavior, behavioral interventions on the transmission of HIV infection. Some of these, like our own in Minikaland, have shown an impact on HIV incidence at the individual level, but none as yet, as far as I'm aware, have shown an impact at the population level. This is possibly partly because effects are difficult to capture due to the diffusion of effects into the comparison areas. So what we did here is as a kind of slight follow-up to the main exercise that I've described. We, we went back and looked at the data that we collected in the first two rounds of our study in Manikaland, which spanned the period <coughs> 1998 to 2003, which was identified as the key period where the most important changes in behavior had taken place. And we found we were able to establish that people who had adopted safer behaviors, who'd reduced their, you know, people, people who previously had multiple partners, who stopped having multiple partners, or people who'd previously been having unprotected casual sex, who stopped doing that, um, tended to have lower rates of new infections compared to their counterparts who considered to, uh, who continued um, to practice those risky behaviors. We've, we found um, that people who had greater exposure to, to national media campaigns through the television or, um, or radio or newspaper information, there was no difference in, in terms of their risk of, of having newly acquired HIV infection as a result of this greater exposure to those, those programs. However, people, particularly women who had participated in HIV AIDS meetings within their local communities, were actually more likely to have adopted safer behaviors. Those um, with relatives with AIDS, perhaps surprisingly, there was no difference. But those who, particularly, and also for men, those who'd recently become unemployed were more likely to have adopted safer behaviors, which is not actually in contradiction with the earlier suggestion that the economic collapse wasn't one of the primary um, drivers of the, of the behavior change, because during this period, 
in our study areas, there was actually a slight drop in the unemployment rate. It was only after 2003 that, that, that the economic collapse really started to hit, hit home. Um, contextual factors. So, as I mentioned earlier on, a key question is why did this happen in Zimbabwe and why has it not happened to the same extent in other countries within the same region? So as part of this ex exercise, some of the team members looked at demographic and health survey data from a number of different neighboring, neighboring countries. And where Zimbabwe stood out was in having very high levels of secondary, secondary school education, even amongst women, um, and a very strong marriage system. And it's possible, it was considered possible, um, that if you have a country where there's a strong culture of marriage, people might be more receptive to, to messages promoting um, faithfulness and sticking to one, to one partner than in other countries where there isn't such a strong culture of, ma of marriage. Okay, so the main conclusions from this whole exercise was that fairly obviously Zimbabwe is, is a very complicated case because of the simultaneous timing of program scale up, the, the peaking of, of AIDS mortality, um, perhaps slightly later the economic collapse I would say, uh, with the, the period of rapid reduction in HIV risk as identified through Tim's modeling work. The evidence suggests that high AIDS mortality probably provided the most important motivation for the behavior changes that we've observed, but the control programs provided knowledge on how to prevent infection, infection and the means for effective protection. The economic decline was an important secondary factor that occurred after behavior began to change, but may have been helpful in sustaining these safer behaviors afterwards. Okay, so there's a lot of people that I should thank um, I could probably take the same amount of time thanking the people that I, <laughs> as I've made in this presentation, and I need to finish. <laughs> um, but very quickly, I'd like to thank um, my f all the friends and family, particularly those who've come, come along today, um, for all your support with, for, for me in, in carrying out this work and for being away and out of the country for so much, so much of the time. Um, I'd like to thank um, Tim Dyson for introducing me to Roy and for his inspirational lectures when I was doing my MSc at the, at the LSE. Um, I'd like to thank Roy himself for taking me on, I think, three times in different, <laughs> different points, now yo-yoing backwards and forwards between Imperial and, and, and Oxford. Um, I need to thank all our funders and partners, particularly the Wellcome Trust, not just because Jimmy is here. Um, <laughs> But really, the, you know, the Wellcome Trust are very, you know, play a, a really important role, uh, particularly in supporting individual researchers like me through their, through their careers. It's a kind of a unique feature of the Wellcome, the Wellcome Trust. Um, I won't go through all the different, the different donors. Okay, I'd like to thank members of our fieldwork teams. This is the current fieldwork team at a retreat earlier this year in Kariba. We do have some fun from time to time, as I'll show you. Um, this probably, <laughs> this probably isn't a complete list of all the people <laughs> who've been involved in the fieldwork activities over the, over the years, but certainly most of them. Um, hopefully you can see yourselves if you're here. There are one or two people dotted around, <laughs> dotted around in the audience here. Thank you for coming. Um, these are a few more people who participated at different times, and some of the, the UK um, collaborators and, and um, team, team members. Obviously, as was mentioned by Brian at the beginning, there are a lot of challenges in conducting um, research in, in Zimbabwe, as I'm sure there are in many other countries as well. It's just, I'm obviously much more aware of the, the ones in Zimbabwe. Um, over time, we've struggled with people thinking we were Satanists and running away from us and coming at us with spears and bows and arrows. <laughs> Problems with fuel shortages, constant power and water cuts having to queue up for everything, often having to travel to South Africa to go and get essential supplies and so forth. But despite that, um, the team have managed to get the work done. And despite that, we've also had a lot of fun in various different ways. Finally, I'd really like to thank two, two very special people who've been involved in the project right from the beginning. Um, sadly, Jeff Garnett over there is about to leave us for the Gates Foundation. Um, and Constance Nyamakapa on the left um, was, as I say, involved right from, right from the beginning and has held things together um, at the Zimbabwe end more or less ever since. And without those two special people, this project would never have happened. Thank you very much. <laughs>